you keep track. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Bronfman Brenner Center for Translational Research. I'm Martha Holden. I'm the director of the Residential Child Care Project. So, so for those of you who aren't part of the center, welcome, and thanks for those of you who are for attending. I'd like to introduce Dr. Barry Burkhardt from the University of Auburn. Hmm? Auburn, Auburn University. University. Oh, sorry, I've done it wrong already. I know. I was trying to remember your title and I forgot <laughs> yeah. where you were from, but uh, he's a, a tenured professor there, and he's an engaged professor. He can <laughs> tell you about his title. Uh, Barry works with us, um, or we work with Barry, uh, down in Alabama, working with the juvenile justice system and implementing one of our programs into a treatment program that he has going down there. I think the most interesting thing about Barry, other than his stories, is that uh, he not only is a professor at a university, but he also runs a juvenile correctional facility. So um, he has a lot of good information to share with us. So please welcome Dr. I, I actually, I think I'm the only professor in the United States who's also a warden. <laughs> but I had good training. I was a department chair for the Department of Psychology for six years, and I was department chair for the Department of Economics as a transitional chair when they got booted out of one college into another. And I figured if you can be a chair of two academic departments, just being a warden is you know, <laughs> a cake. So I have 57 slides and about 40 minutes to do them. And so I'm going to dispense with my stories, but I want to give you a background with what we're doing, because it's unusual. It's, and I think, a model program. It, it was identified as an exemplary program by the American Correctional Institute, American Correctional Association. And it also, I hope, is a paradigmatic program, one that represents how we ought to be doing things. And I'm going to come back to this at the end of the presentation and tell you why I think this is what we need to be doing. Uh, and the only reason I was enticed out of the ivory tower uh, being a tenured full professor, by the way, in case any of you want to know, is a pretty damn cushy job. <laughs> because if you want to, you can sit in your office, and the taxpayers of the good state of Alabama will pay me to read journal articles and answer emails and write a few papers every now and then. And that's not hard. It's really not very hard. <laughs> but 10 years ago, I decided after I, this next year will be my 40th year as a professor. After 30 years, three decades of doing it, I wanted to do something different. And I have been doing work outside in the community in a number of settings, and I have an opportunity to do this. This is the Accountability-Based Sex Offender Program. It's a joint project by Auburn University, University of Alabama, and the Department of Youth Services. The accountability-based part of this is not for the boys who are sent to us. It's for the adults who run the place because the people who need to be held accountable are not 14-year-olds, they're 40-year-olds. The people who need to be held accountable are not these boys who are caught in the circumstances of their lives, but the people who take those boys in these circumstances and often violate the first rule of medicine, which is to do no harm. And so I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking to you about what I think constitutes doing no harm and even doing some good. We'll zip through these very quickly. Can you folks see over there? Anyway. Okay. Um, so it's part of the Mount Meigs campus. Mount Meigs campus is an interesting place. It was the originally the industrial school for Negro youth. It was a segregated uh, boys school that was done. The, it was founded by um, Margaret Washington, Booker T. Washington's wife as an alternative to the Jim Crow treatment of African-American youth who were, who were basically arrested and sold to the local sheriff who sold them to plantation owners who used them to work the fields in the early 1900s. And she saw that happening and she developed this facility and made the state take it over and once it became integrated. One of our graduates is Satchel Paige who is the great Negro baseball player in the Hall of Fame now, never got to play in the majors because he was played in segregated leagues before 42, Jackie Robinson. So the boys come into our dorm, they get one week orientation, we do a pre-treatment assessment. One of the most important things we do is this, and one of the things I'm going to make a case for, I hope, 
is if you're going to try to do something that has more than ephemeral impact, you have to collect data. You have to be able to demonstrate that what you do makes a difference. And so one of the things I'm going to do, one of my friends who's a Jesuit priest was a director of a mental health system in Southern California. He says, if the SOBs want numbers, inundate them with numbers. <laughs> so I'm going to inundate you with numbers, not because you're SOBs, but because you're here. <laughs> what we do when a kid comes in is we measure everything. We code 2,500 variables for every boy who works in our, comes into our program. It's in a database. It's the foundation for my research projects. My graduate students work there. And these are some of the characteristics we do. We do formal measures. Those of you who have, this is the MACI, it's the Milan Adolescent Clinical Inventory, the JESNIS, the Reynolds Adolescent Depression Inventory, Autism Spectrum, about 5% of our boys are Asperger-type kids. The MOPS, the IPPA is an attachment inventory. Cognition scale is a sexual, um, dysfunction, sexual misperception scale. The SASE is a substance abuse measure. That's about half of what they get. We also do intellectual achievement, the uh, WASI, the RAT. We do psychopathy. We do the, um, the psychopathy checklist list youth version because one of the constructs that's very hot in criminology is the construct of psychopathy. And much of what's happening in, in juvenile corrections are inappropriate downward extensions of adult ideas of treating adults that were bad for adults and they're absolutely toxic for adolescents. And we'll, I'll come back to that later. We do the, a risk assessment, two of them, and we also do a, a DSM diagnostic, the case ads, the kitty scheduled thing. So I'm on, our, my program is in, a, is in a residential campus and Mount Meigs is a deep end juvenile correctional facility. It has a 21 foot high fence around it and before they sent our program to there, it was for the oldest, most delinquent boys. I don't know if New York has a level system, one to 10, it's a level 10. It's the most secure setting for juveniles. It was a mistake to put our program there because it turns out that our boys aren't particularly predatory. In fact, they're mostly nerds. <laughs> and that's one of the things that's been a difficulty in running this project but I will tell you what we've done. So one of the things we did was immediately start looking at the differences between our two populations. What we call the general adolescent population, the GAP, are high-risk juvenile delinquents. They have their average of 17. They have, um, even though they're 17, the majority of them are in grades 9 and 10. They're way behind grade level. They have an average IQ. It's in the low average in the low 80s. Our boys are much younger. They're almost two years younger. They're a little bit brighter. They're a little bit less. Uh, one of the other things is different. I think I have it. No, I guess not. One of the big differences, these boys, the GAP kids, have an average of 10 convictions. They've been, they are life course persistent delinquents. And my boys, the modal number of arrests they have is one. The average is two. So they are not particularly delinquent. And that's one of the findings that we came, we identified very early. And as a result of these data, I went to the administration. I said, we got to segregate our campus. We got to take my boys who are lambs away from the wolves because they're going to get eaten up. And in a correctional facility, sex offenders are low people in the totem pole and my boys were getting eaten up. So and you can see in terms of race and ethnicity, my boys were about 50-50, white and black. On the other side of campus, it's 70-30, black to white. Disproportionate representation of minority youth. The percentage of minority youth in Alabama is about 20%, so they're three to four times overrepresented. And that's true across the country. If you really want to know something about that, there's a wonderful book called The New Jim Crow. It's about the use of the American correctional system as an instrument for minority oppression. So on a lot of difference in terms of uh, 
Oh, here we go. Prior mental health context, two-thirds of our boys are on some kind of psychotropic medication. About one in ten of them really needs it. Uh, the new use of medications is an absolute abomination in American psychiatry. I have co kids come in on five psychotropic medications, anticonvulsants, antimanics, antipsychotics, antidepressants. It's like, here, throw some pills at the kid. When nobody has done, there's no history of anybody having done a broad spectrum psychological evaluation. It's just they walk in the psychiatrist's office, sees them two minutes, and throws pills at them. Now, these are the difference between, again, what uh, I'm going to quickly do these, but our boys are more introverted, inhibited, submissive, less egotistic, less unruly, less forceful. They're less delinquent, they're less conduct disordered. And you can see that the red are the boys from the gap, the blue are our boys. And, and I'm going to go through a lot of these slides quickly because they're, the picture is consistent. Same here in terms of our boys are more self-devaluating, they have a great deal more sexual discomfort, they're more socially sensitive. The boys on the other side of campus are the classic picture of callous and indifferent and insensitive, very angry kids. By the time they've been here, they've had three previous incarcerations along with their 10 previous convictions. Um, substance abuse much higher. My boys don't use drugs very much. Um, if they do, it's probably about the base rate of adolescence. If I were to take a survey in here, the incidence rate of using an illegal substance would be close to 90% if you're a typical audience. And that's true of our boys too. They're more depressed, they're more anxious. Um, as you can see, our boys have much less conduct disturbance, much less alcohol, much less substance abuse. They really do. If you walk on campus, you can tell our boys. They are anxious and inhibited and they're not very forthcoming and they're a little bit, at least about 80% of them are. 20% of them are just like the kids on the other side of campus. These are stead pre-incarceration, No, this is after incarceration, one week they've been there. This is when we, we do a pre-treatment assessment. And the pre-treatment assessment is we spend a lot of money. I've got about a $2 million contract to run this program. I spend 10% of it on assessment. And I do that because of several reasons. One is I want to be able, when we do this assessment, we write an eight-page clinical report that is a treatment plan. So every kid has an absolutely personally articulated treatment plan, no cookie cutter. This is what this child in this circumstance needs. They go, they're assigned to an individual therapist. They're in therapy, minim, minimum of twice a week for individual therapy, a minimum of four times a week in some kind of group. And we have a menu of groups in terms of social skills training, sex education, healthy masculinity, emotional self-regulation, meditation group, They're just the whole things. And the groups are assigned on the basis of what their treatment assessment. So the pre-treatment assessment informs their clinical treatment. It also serves as a pre-measure for treatment effectiveness. Because at the end of treatment, they get the same set of measures again. So we can look at their pre-functioning and their post-functioning. And we also go back and collect recidivism data, and I'll get to that in a minute. And the third purpose, so we have, this serves as a clinical information, it serves as a baseline for measuring treatment effectiveness, and the third thing is, this is the best way to do science. Collect really good measurements. And so we've done 20 dissertations and master's thesis out of this, and continue to do those because we code 2,500 variables at pre-take and 1,500 post-test. So we've got 4,000 variables on every kid who comes to the program. So this is what we find at intake. The juveniles with sex offenders are more frequent and severe symptoms of mood and anxiety disorders. The GAP students, externalizing disorders, including conduct disorder. The GAP students have higher frequency of symptoms with alcohol. It's really 100%. The kids who are saying they're not, they're lying. The, the substance abuse is a, a powerful problem in the life of delinquent juveniles. So we also wanted to now look at our group of sex offenders and say, what are they like? 
what, what are the distinctions, the clinically relevant distinctions that we can make among them? And so we've done a number of projects that look at, for example, what kind of children they seek to offend against. Most of our boys, 80% of them, offend against children. Do they pick girl children or boy children or both? Do they offend against people who are family or strangers? And we've got a lot of data about that, and I'll, if you're interested at the end, I'm hoping to leave 15, 20 minutes for you guys to tell, ask questions. But I'm going to show you one of the ways that we look at carve up our data and look at distinctions, because the, the point you need to understand is these boys are very different. They're not of one type. Every kid there is different, and we're trying to make some meaningful similarities with the work we're doing in terms of creating a taxonomy of boys who are juvenile sex offenders. The other thing is my boys are not a sample from the state of Alabama. If you're convicted of a criminal juvenile sex offense in Alabama, you come to EPSOP. It's the only program in the state. There are no outpatient programs. Alabama is a very poor, under-professionally served state, and so we get them all. Except for a few kids, Alabama now runs an aftercare and alternative care. So if I get an 11-year-old who has one victim and a sympathetic judge, I don't have to take him into EPSOP as long as he's in one of nine counties that are served by this alternative program. There are 67 counties in Alabama. So here's what we do. We did basically a cluster analysis. It's a statistical process, not a very good one, in which you try to identify in conceptual space like members. And what we've come up with is five, this is an earlier iteration of our analysis. We ended up with five groups. The largest group were the about 50% or 40% were anxious, submissive, passive. Interesting. Now, when you think of sex offenders, do you think of anxious, submissive, and passive? No, you think of predators and people who spirit children off and cut their arms off or their heads off and stuff like that. What you need to know about adolescent sex offenders is that they're not sex offenders. I want you to listen to that. Adolescent sex offenders are not sex offenders. The noun does not apply to them. They are boys with sex offending histories. Because it turns out, as you'll see, they don't continue to sex offend. And so I thought I'd run a program for adults in the, the state prison for adults for a long time, and I thought that these boys were gonna be the ones who ended up in adult prison. Apparently not. And that's a, a complex issue, and I'd, I'd like to talk about it if anybody's interested. But Right. So we have a anxious, submissive, a dysthymic shame, high rates of abuse, neglect, and sexual victimization in both of these groups. We have a group, remember I said that 20% of the boys are like the other side. We have a group of narcissistic delinquents who have higher rates of conduct disorder and so on and so forth. Distressed delinquent who, that, that group tends to fall out when we do cluster analysis. It's an unstable group. And then a group... Any place other than Alabama, 10% of our boys would be in a psychiatric hospital. They have diagnosis of severe borderline personality disorder or pre-psychotic syndrome, but instead they're in the jail because it, there is no place. There's no place else for them. And so in essence, I'm a warden of a prison that has a mental health unit, has an Asperger's unit, has a mental retardation unit, because we get them all, I and mean, we have to provide treatment to all of them. The clusters, there are the five clusters. We we're doing some neat research looking at do the membership in clusters predict the type of recidivism? Which cluster would you think had the most delinquent recidivism? You'd probably pick this group right here, right? That narcissistic delinquent group. Well, I'll be able to tell you in about two weeks when my student sends me her dissertation data. <laughs> <laughs> um, Post treatment. So the kids come in, we treat them. The treatment, I'm gonna say just a word about that, it's not really the focus of this presentation, but it is everything. It is the ideal treatment. I've hired experts, we train them. Each therapist has a small caseload, six to eight kids. They see them at least twice a week. Most of the time they see them five times a week. They see them every day. They do what I call hallway therapy. How you doing? Let me see your conduct sheet. Oh, you're good, way to go. 
keep it up. I'll see you tomorrow in my office. And so there is that integrated context. The other thing is I very quickly realized that I could not do treatment in a facility where abuse was happening. And abuse happens in prisons. It's the context. And my boys were being routinely abused. Get your fat ass down, boy, I said that. Then that just was sort of routine talking to them. So I said to the administration, I'm not going to run the program unless you give me the authority to make the residential program a therapeutic program. And so we brought in the Cornell folks, and we do the care model, the adolescent residential experience, and my staff have really bought into this. So they really do care for these kids. There's no more abuse happening. It is, it's probably one of those things that's going to spontaneously combust because they just don't exist very often. <laughs> but these kids come in, they get this psychological assessment, they get good therapists, the residential staff work with them, care for them. We have all kinds of activities. I have a, a sound um, room that they make their own um, rap music, and we let them burn a DVD or a CD, and they keep it. We have a creative arts project. I hire the Alabama Writers Forum to send a creative writer, a published writer, to do creative writing. We publish their poems in an annual book, and they get several copies to send to their mamas and granddaddies, and, and they are... You've never seen anything like a kid stand up in front of a group and read his poem, and you think, oh, that's not a predatory delinquent. That's just a kid who's proud, and it's true. So post-treatment, post-data, I'm just going to go through this really quickly. What you see is on every measure that we take, they get better. The depression gets better, the ADHD. Look at that. What looks like ADHD on intake is agitation. Conduct disorder, which is, right, untreatable. That's what you're taught. Drops way down, tobacco use. <laughs> I have to make a confession about the substance abuse. The, the, this, the case ads is for the previous six months. Where have they been in the previous six months? <laughs> so this is smuggling. <laughs> it's a correctional environment. They get cigarettes. The staff on the other side of campus brings them in and sells them. <laughs> it's, a pretty close time frame. it's variable. The kids are committed until treatment is complete. And when we first started running the program, we averaged 18 to 20 months per child. We realized it was overkill. We average eight to 12 months now, right about 10 months is average. Some kids we keep four years. About 5% of our kids have relatively fixated arousal patterns to children. And they are very difficult to treat, and we really have to work at that. And those kids, they, they can't, I can't send them back to court until they're... Some kids come to us and they have been committed what's called juvenile life. And that means till the age of majority, which is 21. So I have 14-year-olds committed for seven years to us every now and then. If a kid gets better, I can go back to the court, get on my knees and beg and say, you keep this kid here four more years, and you're going you're gonna to have a dysfunctional child because adolescents need a normal environment to progress normally. And there's nothing normal about our environment. So... Across the board, this is an interesting one. This is what they come in as. This is what they leave as. This is the norm reference group. So if you took a bunch of high school students, this is where they would be. And as you can see, these kids are a whole lot better. They ain't well. And the reason they're not well is that they are very damaged. 40% uh, of our kids have been sexually abused. 30% have been physically abused. About 60% have been neglected in some formal way. And so the, the, these boys come in with lots of psychological damage, which is why you can't put kids in even benign environments without, I think, effective psychological treatment. And so these boys are in a relatively benign environment, as benign as I can make it, and they get really good treatment. They get better. Uh, across the board, this is from the uh, the Mackey, same thing. So the difference is 
They are less apathetic, less sensitive to rejection, less depression, <coughs> more compliant. The interesting thing is there's one measure. Remember, our boys aren't very delinquent, and they're in a highly delinquent setting. So what do you think happens to their delinquency scores? They get more delinquent. Let's see, where is it? Anyway, this is all the same thing. The body disapproval goes down. The identity diffusion. Ah, delinquency predisposition. They get a little bit more delinquent after they're with us and around all those other boys. Not a good thing. What we are really good at is treating trauma and internalization disorders. These kids come in really depressed, very, very anxious. They're scared. They're terrified. And we're really good at treating that. We make that better. We do a reasonably good job on conduct disorder, too, and I'll say some more about that in a minute. Okay, so this is the stuff that they're better on. Recidivism data. So these kids come in, we treat them, they go back to the court. The court assigns a risk level, low, medium, or high. It's a very, it used to be, it just has changed, and it's changed in a bad way. And if I have some time, I'll talk about the policy implications of these data that you're about to see. But, okay, what's the recidivism rate you would expect for sex offending delinquent boys? Anybody want to take a shot at it? Seven. Who's going to take the upper or the, what is it in the betting? The over or the under? <laughs> Who wants to bet the over? Before hearing you, I would have expected 60%. Yeah. I don't think it's 50%, but I already know the answer. Yeah. <laughs> you cheated. Okay. <laughs> what was the first one? Seven. Seven percent. So we have in the first, we've done this twice. We've done, we do this every two years. We go to the national, the Alabama Office of Courts and get National Crime Information Center data on arrest. We don't look at convictions, arrest. So it's a very liberal estimate of recidivism because many of the kids arrested aren't found guilty. And we use re-arrest and what we find is that 3.9% of the kids are re-arrested for a sex offense. Of those, about half, so in this circumstance we're talking about nine boys, had what I would consider to be a reasonably serious offense. The other ones were pretty iffy, exhibitionism, that sort of stuff. Seventy percent um, have no arrest, and that should be 60 percent. I don't know why it says 69. Interestingly, 5.3 percent of them are rearrested for a technical violation of their registration requirements. Under the recent change in the law, we had the same rate of rearrest for sex offenses, about 3.94%, but now it's up to 8% rearrest because they failed to go in and they have to they have to go to the county sheriff every 3 months and register as a sex offender and Make sure that their address is correct. If they don't do that, they're subject to rearrest. And how many of you would remember to go to the county sheriff or would and go say, oh, I need to sign in as a sex offender every three months? So, 3.9%. Um, no aftercare. There's no aftercare because it doesn't exist in the state. One of the things I'm hoping to do is start giving each of these kids a smartphone when they leave, and we'll do aftercare through the smartphone. I figured, hell, I can buy those for 100 bucks a piece. That's a whole lot cheaper than rearresting a kid. You know, they come back into the joint, it's $90,000 a year. So 100 bucks, maybe we can do something half that rearrest rate, particularly since a lot of the rearrests are really for stupid stuff. <laughs> I mean, you know, following a girl in the girl's restroom and showing her your weenie. Not smart. <laughs> okay. So these are the rearrest data. And by the way, sexting, I know none of you would do this, but boys and girls are really proud of their new apparatus. And they love to take pictures and send them to their girlfriends. Well, we have a boy who's got juvenile life because he took a picture of his penis and he sent it to his girlfriend and she was 15. She was a minor. 
and that's a federal offense. He was 18, and he got convicted of trafficking pornographic information to a juvenile. Because a DA can get away with anything that he wants to. And all he had was he was proud of his new penis. We arrest, by the way, these are for the Gap Boys. The rearrest rate for there is 75%. I'm, I'm convinced that if I followed them out long enough, it'd be probably close to 100%. Um, they have very high rearrest rates. And for a pretty significant number of them are violent offenses. Okay. So the Gap rearrest. So the implications. The, the, the best meta-analysis I've seen is by uh, Retzel and Carbonell, and they're the sort of median rate for rearrest was 12%, 13%. Ours is 3.9%. I've never seen anybody in the country with a lower rearrest rate than what we have, particularly if they're not dealing with a convenience sample. I mean, a lot of programs get to pick the kids that come to them. I don't get to pick anybody. The county sheriff delivers them in shackles, and they are with us. And by the way, we have a 99% successful completion of treatment. Now, it does help that they have to stay there until they finish. <laughs> so I've got a little handle on the, you know, you don't get the early out if you don't like what's happening. And a lot of the kids, we've done, we do lots of research. I mean, I can't, I mean, I can't. So one of my students said, I know this kid's lying to me. At free test. I said, of course they are. You're going to tell somebody that you, you know, made an eight-year-old child suck on your penis? No, you're not going to tell that. So we thought, what about at the end of treatment? So we went back, we designed a little survey, and at the end of treatment, brought the kid back in, we do the post-test, and as part of the post-test, we say, now that you finished treatment and the court has your risk report and that you've done so well, did you tell us the truth? <laughs> what percentage of kids say, no, I didn't tell the truth? 82 or 88 percent, I can't remember which, and the other ones were lying. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody tells the truth. You don't tell the truth. If I ask you, when was the last time you did marijuana? You're not going to tell me that. People don't tell the truth. You know, that's just, they, we, we are monkeys with a cortex. We lie like rugs. And so... <laughs> Anywho, we have a very good program. We do a good job. Uh, now, here's the thing that I want us to talk about for a little bit, if we can. Have I been professional long enough? I didn't hear this. I can't say I don't sweat much for a fat boy. <laughs> Anywho, so the public policy in this country has recently changed during George Bush's administration along with leading us into two gratuitous wars and busting our national treasure, John Ashcroft also changed laws for juveniles in the most restrictive way that's ever happened since we created juvenile courts. And here's what happened. In Alabama, the law was that a kid was identified as high risk, medium risk, or low risk based on a, a a palette of factors, but the most important factor was how they did in treatment. In other words, I could tell a child, look, work on this. You know you didn't want to do that and you got some problems. Work on this. And, you know, you'll be able to go back to the judge and maybe you get low risk. And low risk means that you are treated like a juvenile. Your information is kept confidential. It doesn't go on a website and so on. If you go back in, in Alabama, the law was if you went back as high risk, the law said you will be treated as an adult. For all And all the adult requirements, which are very onerous, you go on a website, they have a map. You know, if you, have you ever you go look at the registry? You can find out there are sex offenders living all around you. And you can look up, you know, what this kid. So you got a 14-year-old kid going back to junior high, and his classmates can look him up on the computer and talk about a social death. That's a social death. But because I also had data saying that 96% of my boys don't ever sexually reoffend, I can be right 96% of the time, which in psychology is unbelievable, just by saying they're not, none of them are going to reoffend. And we did. 
we rarely sent a high risk back to the court. Very rarely. The child basically had to say, I'm going to go back and have sex with the first child I see for us to make a recommendation of high risk for the court. But the law was changed because of the Adam Walsh Act. And in the Adam Walsh Act, states who want to continue to receive federal money for their law enforcement activities have to write statutes in compliance with the National Adam Walsh Act, which means that at age 14, if you commit one of five offenses, rape one, sodomy one, sex abuse one, sexual torture, or conspiracy to commit any of those five, and your victim is 12 or under, remember most of our boys, the modal age of the victim in our boys are eight, most of our boys have now a lifetime registration requirement. That's what the law says. It doesn't depend on how you do in treatment. It doesn't depend on the circumstances. And by the way, if any of you know anything about district attorneys and charging practices, it's a joke. It has no relationship to reality. They don't like this kid. He's going to get sex abuse one. This kid has a lawyer and some money. It's going to be sexual misconduct. Just that simple. They just Because in juvenile court, you don't really have the same rights and protections. You're supposed to have a benevolent judge, but judges get elected in Alabama, and district attorneys get elected, and so they just don't do it. So the public policy, I think, implications of our data are enormous. In Alabama, at least, no child should have a lifetime registration. Their registration should expire at the age of 18 when they become subject to adult courts. And if we do that, because part of our theoretical principle is we try to create a normal developmental trajectory for these boys whose developmental trajectory has been hijacked by abuse, neglect, etc. And so we try to create a context where there we reestablish what is a reasonable normal developmental trajectory. We teach them that, oh yeah, by the way, since your testosterone toxic all boys are, by the way. You know, they have 80 times the level of androgens that women do. And androgens are the sex drive. And so boys come with a built-in sex drive. And any of you girls, I'm sure, testify to it. Because you deal with it all the time. And we teach these boys, you've got to be responsible. You've got to learn how to take care, how to manage your sexual impulses and feelings. And, then, and we have very candid conversations. And you know how many of the boys say that's the first time anybody has talked to them directly? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And a lot of these guys say, oh, you mean it's okay for me to, you know, lust after girls? Yep. You're going to do it. You might as well get used to it. Uh, it comes with the territory. So the public policy implications, I think, are profound. There are other policy implications. I, I briefly want to go through those. The first is that treating juveniles as adults is a mistake. They are not adults. All of you were an adolescent. Can you think back with absolute unembarrassment about all your conduct? No. Young and dumb is one word. <laughs> and we now have the MRI results to show it. You know, if you put an adolescent brain in an MRI and ask them to think about what bad things could happen to you if you, well, their brain a little flicker, Right here. If you put an adult in, the whole frontal cortex lights up. They just don't, they're not neurologically mature. Adolescence is a period of neurological maturation, and it is particularly a period of social and interpersonal maturation. We learn how to get along with our romantic partners, we learn to get along with our friends, we learn to relate to authority in a less than just conforming but in an engaged way, it's a critical time. And putting kids in a prison is a, huge, it's a bad idea. I run a prison project. I don't like it. I wish that we didn't have to have kids in prison. I think I could get the same results. The other thing is so that all our policies need to be reviewed. And by the way, it's, this is true across the board. We're learning that you can treat juveniles who have sex offenses. And I'm pretty sure... If you give me enough control so that I have control of the people who are in contact with the kids, I'm pretty sure I can get it close to zero. 
I actually think we can. Which is, in human behavior, I mean, we are messy creatures, right? We just are. And to be able to do that is an astonishing accomplishment and ought to have policy implications. So we, we shouldn't treat adults, I mean, adolescents like adults. Secondly, if we're going to put kids in treatment, we really have to make sure it's treatment. Many kids go to settings that are terrible. My setting is still terrible in spite of a decade's worth of work that I've been trying to do. You know, one of the things, I, I'll tell one story. I love this story. So I started to run this program, and Mount Meigs is the most malignant place you ever see. You go through a 21-foot high fence. We have a prison in the middle of it. We live in trailers. It's horrible. There's no activities. The school is a joke. The teachers don't teach. It's, it's just terrible. It's 102 yeah. humidity. Yeah. And we're in the middle of a swamp. There's a, there's a swamp in the middle of the campus, and we all the time have to look out for the moccasins. And so I was trying to, I was trying, one of the things I decided at the very beginning is that I'm going to enrich this environment. So I brought in arts program and creative writing programs. And one day in March, it was a, about a day like this, the wind was blowing. I thought, kites. Didn't you fly kites when you were a kid? None of my kids had ever flown a kite. So I stopped at Walmart. I bought 100 bucks worth of kites. And I brought them to campus. And, of course, the rest of the campus is going berserk. What the hell are you doing? Are you giving these kids kites? What can they do, fly over the fence? <laughs> oh, no. Never underestimate adolescents. What they did is there happens to be a power line that goes across our campus. Now, why would you build a power line across a secure campus? So one of the kids wrapped his kite around the power line, and instead of waiting for an adult, what did he do? Tried to pull it. And when you have string wrapped around power lines and you pull real hard, what does it do? Bam! Art blew out the power line. That power line fed the state prison three miles away. And we killed the power in the state prison for about four hours. <laughs> I was banned from breaking ice to <laughs> What did I know? But anyway, I, the fact that I continued to work for this project after doing that is testimony to the necessity that they needed for having somebody develop a treatment program. I always loved that one. Anyway, so I'm going to stop. I've been going 40 minutes, 45 minutes. And I've got another set of slides that have to do with the CARE project, but I'm going I'm to stop because I want to get, I'm, as you probably gather, I talk a lot. <laughs> so I want to slow down a little bit and let you ask me some questions. And um, so, say I want to make three picks. Don't treat adolescents as adults. Do something about public policy. And if you're going to put kids in prison or anywhere, make sure you create a benevolent developmental context. If you don't do that, you're the criminal. You incarcerate kids and you know it's a malignant experience, and it is because we have to look at the gap outcomes. And by the way, the DYS has asked me now to design a treatment program for the gap kids, and that's what we're starting to gear up for now. So. I just read 440. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Do you know what the recidivism rate was before you took over the program? No. Why didn't I know? They didn't ever have people. Not a single one. We were doing some archival research on the number of lockups. 55% of the daily log pages were missing. <laughs> like, there were no records, no electronic records, there was no assessment. I don't even know what kids were in. I think they can they can do it, but I, I've learned very quickly to keep my own database. My database is separate for the DYS. Um, but I don't think it would be high. 
Because I think if you don't do anything with these kids, 20% of them will re-offend re for sexually. If you do a, a half-assed job, you can knock it down to 15, 12 to 15. And if you really work at it, you can get it close to zero for sex offenses. Delinquent misconduct, that's a, that's a tougher thing. I have a theory about what we should do about delinquent misconduct. If anybody asks, I'll tell you. <laughs> but other other questions about the sex offender, juvenile sex offender part. Oh, come on, don't be bashful. Yes, ma'am. Are these kids coming out and going back to their parents' homes or foster parents? What, what situations? Highly variable. It turns out that these kids' lives before they come in is extremely messy. Mom's in jail for cooking up meth. Dad's in jail for beating up mom. And so, and sometimes judges will, even if we do reunification treatment, they won't let the boys go back if the victim is in the home. And most of our boys' victims are non-strangers, okay? They're family, relatives, friends, nieces, nephews, that sort of thing. Um, so... Uh, most of them go back home, but not all of them by all means. And some of them don't have anything to go back to. I have once, I swore I'd never do anything like this. I watched DYS hand a kid a bus ticket to Chicago where somebody might have been waiting. Yes, ma'am. So um, I know that this is just all male facility, but yeah. what's going on with girls in Alabama? Um, there was a facility called Chalkville, which recently was blown up by a tornado. It's gone. It's destroyed. Um, and those girls who have sex offenses, we had a therapist in Birmingham, Chalkville, was Rex, and we would provide the therapy for sex offending girls. And they were pretty rare. You know, we'd have maybe one or two a year. Uh, and they, they, their dynamics are a great deal different. Uh, so... But there are some, you know, there's a literature on that. I don't know much about it because I don't treat them, really, but yes. So you probably know Tom Tishon's work on, mm -hmm. like, where finding that if you put, I think it was specifically conduct disorders, right. you put them together for group, group therapy. Uh, the they will find the, the lowest common denominator. Yeah. 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 And then a lot of that is mediated through just a lot of nonverbal kind of uh, 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 this guy is asking a question. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of nonverbal affirmation of like, uh, yeah, it's a, it is a question. Believe me, <laughs> but I mean, no, that's what happens. If you, that's what we. That's one of the reasons our primary treatment modality is not group. We don't do I was process. Ask you how you deal with that to minimize the We we don't do process groups, except for special needs kids for whom we know we have the content control. So we do a loss group for parental loss or sibling loss. A lot of our kids come out of the project that watched a brother get shot. And those groups, when we get them, they don't that stuff doesn't happen. We run a sex sexual victimization group. And past the third group meeting, that stuff doesn't happen. If you run just a delinquent process group, you're gonna have the most delinquent kid in the place being the co leader. He's the co-leader. Hell, he's going to be the leader. And so we don't do that. And, and then why did, were you kind of responding to that research, or did you already oh, have yeah. that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd, I'd seen that research and seen the Washington group stuff and, and had worked in – I've worked in juvenile settings since 1971. And so I had seen that process and knew I'd never be able to overcome the power of the group cohesiveness around delinquent norms in a delinquent setting. So our – our groups are primarily psychoeducational, and so they're very didactic, and we have lots of videos and, and activities. And so there's not a lot of opportunity for that kind of... No. Uh, and, and if it happens, we send a kid out of the group. You can't be in this group. Again, we don't have to have a kid in any group, and it's, it's seen kind of as a privilege. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in bribery. So, you know, if the kid wants to be make his rap song and work with our the really cool, very good-looking woman who does the rap music stuff, 
He's got to show up in group and behave. Or he won't vote. He won't. He will not go. You know, I got a three thousand dollar mixer, and we can make cool rap sounds. And I commissioned a rap song. One of my really, really good poets. I said, I want an orientation song for Absop. I should have that. It's great. It's an amazing song. Yes, ma'am. So thinking about the policy, and I guess my question is, how are you going to, or how will you craft the policy message for something that the broader culture sees as like, tough on crime and sex offense the work? You know, how do you craft something using research to convince people when it seems so counterintuitive, and where do you start? Most people, when they ask me a question, have some idea of an answer. Since I don't have an answer for the question, I'm hoping you do. Are you a public relations major or anything? No. I start, so I work on dating violence, which is yeah. not as serious in that way, but it's hard because a lot of boys are victims. So you try and craft policy around that, and it's very yeah. it's reacted to so strongly. So I was more asking You know, what, what, I, what I'm interested in trying to find out is what we have to do is we have to change a mindset. You know, if, nowadays, if you say bullying, it's it's not like it was when I started practicing where it was called the wussies get bullied. They deserve it. I mean that the the public information available has changed, so we no longer tolerate bullying. I mean I actually if I have a kid that's being bullied and I, I can call the principal and say, uh, did you know this? Now that you know this, what you gonna do? And he'll do something. Or she'll do something didn't happen before. So we've changed. So we've got to change. What we really have to do is not work on juvenile sex offenders. We've got to work on children. The idea that children is a protected space and stage. And anybody, and, and we've really got to push that message because I want to make sure that folks end up with the idea that what we're dealing with are children who've made childish mistakes. And we don't want to burden them with a lifetime consequence, you know, that's like suicide, a permanent solution for a temporary problem. Putting a kid with, on a lifetime registry, oh my God, that's, that really is social death. So I think what we've got to do is really start, first of all, I, I've got these data and I'm up in front of legislatures, you know, stick it in their nose and I ask to go talk to juvenile judges, I go do a presentation anywhere at the drop of a hat, because it's going to take a critical momentum um, and we're going to have to admit that we were wrong. But actually, we don't. The interesting thing that I've discovered is if people don't have to admit they're wrong and they get a chance to do something different, they'll do it more readily than if they have to admit they were wrong and then do it. So I try not to push people's noses at the fact they're stupid as stumps. <laughs> yeah. If, if I'm a 20... Uh, Six-year-old, uh, just gotten my master's or my PhD, and I was thinking about juvenile corrections as a career. What are the kinds of, of uh, kind of, oh, I don't know, skills, personality traits, uh, whatever, um, might I want to look at in terms of some reflection about whether I'd be appropriate for that? I actually think. I, I'm, I'm not always cynical, by the way. It, to take on a project like this, you have to be an idiot or an optimist, and my wife says I'm both. And so um, I really think things are going to change. I think we've seen the pendulum swing, you know, like it always does, and we've, we've, we've realized that we've made some really, really fundamental mistakes in policy for juveniles, and I actually think it's coming back. So to answer your question, I think what you're going to see is more and more treatment being provided to juveniles, and more and more recognition of what constitutes <coughs> treatment. And we're going to change the metaphor. Here's the metaphor for the current juvenile correctional facility. The metaphor is that adolescents are dangerous. They're super predators. They need confinement. Um, quick story. So in the 50s and 60s, violence rates among young people went up real fast, way before your time. But in response to that, we enacted draconian drug laws. New York, the worst. Rockefeller, who is a reasonably decent fellow, enacted these draconian mandatory minimum sentences and so on and so forth, get tough on crime, primarily having to do with drug and violence. But it turns out that the violence 
increase among particularly adolescents in the 50s and 60s corresponded perfectly to the amount of lead being emitted into the environment because we didn't have no lead gasoline because the oil companies didn't want to do it because it cost a little bit more and they made more money using less refined gas. If you took enamel samples out of children's teeth and that we have them from all the dentists and you looked at the amount of lead in deposited in their teeth, which is an exact isomorphic relationship to the amount of lead being deposited in their medullas and in the part of the brain that controls emotional regulation, that was almost a perfect correspondence with the increase in particularly violent, impulsive crime. So, as a nation, we poisoned our children because we were not aware and we Actually, we were aware, but the, in case you haven't figured out, the oil lobby is pretty damn powerful. And for years, they fought off regulation removing lead from gas in spite of the fact that we had abundance evidence that violent crime was being committed by this. So if you have the idea that correctional policies are, need to be super confinement, then you also have a number of implications. The way you treat kids is with indifference, with control, with coercion, with incarceration, and so on. My metaphor for juvenile crime is that children have been left alone or not cared for. And what you have to do is address those. So you have to not leave them alone and let them raise themselves, and you have to care for them. And if we have to do that in surrogate settings, because our families are so damaged, then we ought to do it well. And that's where I put my money on what we need to be doing. It's 1 o'clock. I was told that I turn into a frog at 1. <laughs> I'm no longer a prince. I'm a frog. You're a frog. So thank you. All right. Thank you.